the deflated ball just flops into the ground like that did, right? Emptiness. You know it when you see it. Maybe you've had that experience when you're driving your car and all of a sudden something happens and, and you can feel that and you know your tire has gone flat and you're worried maybe because you're in the center lane and you got to get over to the right and you, and you pull over and finally you're able to get to safety and maybe get some air in that tire. Emptiness, you know it when you see it. Emptiness, you also know it when you taste it. How many of you ever had flat soda? Does anybody remember that they used to have Coca-Cola syrup that was available in case you were, had a cough problem? Anybody remember that? Yeah, you remember it. Nobody remembers that, huh? My mother used to use that as a remedy. She would say, I'm going to get you some Coke. And I'd think, what does that mean? I thought it was going to be good. I thought it was going to be soda. But <clears throat> then she gave me this stuff that was all flat and tasted like syrup. Awful. Just awful. <clears throat> Emptiness. Empty of zest in that soda's case. Empty of air in the basketball's case. Emptiness. We know it when we see it. Emptiness. Jesus knew it when he saw it too. Here comes this man who by day probably seems very confident. He is a member of the Jewish ruling council. His name is Nicodemus. And I would guess if you were to see him, you would say, there's a man who knows the laws of God. There's a man who follows the laws of God. There's a man who must be close to God. He comes to Jesus at night. And he probably comes to Jesus at night because he maybe didn't want everyone to know where he was going because Jesus wasn't necessarily so popular with the Pharisees and scribes and teachers of the law. But Nicodemus felt an emptiness inside. And in Jesus' words, he had begun to think that there was something more. Something more than what he was used to. He was used to the laws and traditions. He was used to being at the temple. He was used to being at the festivals and feasts, offering up the sacrifices that were required. He was used to doing things. But in doing all those things, he still didn't feel the relationship with God. He understood who God was. He understood who he was. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he needed help. But the rules and laws and traditions weren't necessarily, weren't necessarily filling him with joy. So he came to Jesus, and Jesus knew why he was there. Jesus saw his need, and Jesus was going to respond to his need. Emptiness. Jesus knew it when he saw it. Emptiness. You and I know it when we see it too, don't we? The spiritual emptiness that surrounds us. We see people who lack a sense of purpose, a sense of value, a sense of their own identity. And so we see a lot of things happening around us that are distressing. I was at a breakfast the other day, and they were talking about this a little bit in healthcare. They were talking about the crisis of opioids and how people are looking for, for God in, in, a, in a drug. They're looking for some kind of relationship, but they're not getting peace and joy from the opioids, and it's a real epidemic. They also mentioned the very high suicide rate. The numbers are staggering. The tenth reason for the tenth, the top ten, I can't come up with a way to say this, but the tenth reason why people are no longer with us is, uh, is suicide. It is the second highest cause of death among people between the ages of 10 and 35. Why? 
We have so many good things around us. And yet, there is a void in the hearts of so many. There's violence. We see it on the news again this week. More shootings. It's almost become commonplace so many times. People going into the schools or in another place, their workplace or whatever, and so filled with a void that they want to explode. And they do explode. And maybe there is someone there who stops it from causing even more death and destruction. We see the void in the stories about misuse of people. So many, news, so many stories here of men who have misused women or of others who have taken advantage of still other people. And we can see it. We look outside and we see the emptiness, the void. But it's not just out there. It can be in here too. An emptiness. There are those days when it seems so hard. Days of depression. Days of fear. Days of anxiety. Some days we just feel empty. Jesus knew the emptiness too. Because he came into this world, Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and He empties Himself. Philippians puts it this way, He humbled Himself and became obedient, obedient even unto death. He knew the pain of sin because He came into this world to carry that sin for us. And he lowered himself, set aside, in a sense, set aside his godliness so he could walk in our shoes, know our temptations, and know our emptiness, and know our pain, because that's what sin does. Sin brings emptiness in so many different ways. Jesus came to experience that. And boy, he sure did. On the cross, he made it very evident as he cried out, those horrific words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew the consequences of sin. He knew where that was leading. And he took it for you and me to knock down the barriers between us and God, to make it possible for us to have a relationship with him, to make it possible for us to know peace and joy and eternity. Jesus comes to Nicodemus and he sees that emptiness that sin brings. And he makes plain to Nicodemus that there is another way. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, he tells Nicodemus. And then he says those most wonderful words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus, you want a relationship with God? He's reaching down to you. He sent me, Nicodemus. He sent me to carry your pain, to carry your struggles, to carry your burdens, to die your death, so that your sin could be taken care of, washed away. And you could be made new. And you could be filled with the Spirit. Anybody have anything valuable in their possession that was once owned by somebody famous? Anybody have something like that? Even maybe a, a football helmet that Brett Favre wore, or uh, I don't know, anything? Yeah? A batting helmet of Cal Ripkins, once worn on his head, we presume. Maybe still some DNA in there, right? <laughs> Not sure that you want to think about that, but yeah, maybe so. Um, imagine the value of having an original Rembrandt. Imagine the value of owning, if you could, 
the Declaration of Independence. It's just a piece of paper, right? But it's not because of who was connected to it. That helmet is valuable because of who it was connected to. This is what Jesus wants Nicodemus to know. That he, that, that he Jesus, came to make Nicodemus God's own child. To make him precious in God's sight. And he would do it by being lifted up on the cross to pay the price for all sins. And forever after that, as Nicodemus trusted in Jesus as his Savior, he would know that he is God's child. He is special. He is valuable. He is loved because he is God's. That answer is there for us too, my friends. Not just for the people out there who are empty and who are struggling, but in, in our hearts too. There are those days and God says to us, you are mine. I died for you. You are special to me. I love you. And I've given my Holy Spirit to live in you. Imagine that. The God who created all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My goodness, how many times have we sung about Him today? A lot. Because He's worthy. And He who is worthy of, of, of the greatest honor and praise is in you. You are His. And that means you are precious and you are valuable. And there is a reason for you to be here. God has a purpose for you and a plan. Never let the enemy fool you into thinking that you are empty. Never let him fool you into thinking that you have no identity and no value. He'll do it whenever he can. He really wants to drag you down. But hear those words once again that Jesus said to Nicodemus. God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That makes us, my friends, the farthest thing from empty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having heard his word, let us declare our Christian faith to him and to one another in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please again be seated as we receive your offering.